today? Great. That's better. Ooh. Oh. Does that make a difference? Okay, my ears are old, so <laughs> everything, about, everything about me is old. How's everybody doing today? Good. Exams are back and available, and as a matter of fact, I have some news in that respect. I have a set of grades. There's the grades. I'll post these on the schedule page later, but you can see where you are. Exams are available for pickup in ALS 2011. The average on the exam was 67. Uh, the low grade was 10. The high grade was 102. Okay, uh, And you can see those are approximate distributions of the grades. All right. It's dad's weekend, right? Dads are here. How many dads do we have today? Should we give the dads a pop quiz? What do you guys think? Make them sing. Make them sing. Well, well, maybe we should make them sing. Is everybody going to the football game tonight? Anybody had trouble getting a ticket? You have? Okay, here you go. I, this, this was not me. Somebody left it up here and said, give it to one of the students. And I said, okay. So I figured I'd find somebody that couldn't get a ticket. Uh, kind of a cool thing, huh? Somebody, I, I had no idea who did that. That's, that's kind of nice. I hope it's a good ticket. It's not counterfeit or something, you know. <laughs> Yes, so uh, let's see, back to here. And um, dads are here, so you think that dads should sing, is that right? Yeah. Well, dads, I'm, I'm guessing that your, your children have been talking about this class, and I, I worry a little bit about that, I have to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> so maybe this is what they've been telling you. So let's, uh, you guys, uh, you guys you know the rules, right? What's the rules? You've got to sing loud if you want extra credit on the next exam. So we've got a song for dad. Um, it's called Oh Daddy Dear, and it's to the tune of Oh, oh Danny Boy, okay? Oh Daddy Dear, this is my biochemistry. The problem's long, the course is really tough. That last exam, it really put the fear in me. I studied lots, I hope it was enough. But let's forget about it while you're visiting. And bong a beer when we get out of class. Then when you're gone, I'll go back to my studying. That Kevin Ahern really, truly is an awesome. Uh, <laughs> okay, so we will have an extra credit question. <laughs> it kind of depends on what you guys had to say about that. I, all right. So anyway, whatever they've been telling you, it's not true. Okay. All right. So um, we are moving our way through talking about how enzymes are controlled. And as I said last time, that's really critical because control of enzymes is essential for cells. Uh, cells have to respond to their environment. You're going to hear that over and over. That environment might mean that, hey, we've got to run, we've, uh, we've got, we're a muscle cell, we've got to contract, we've got to get out of this situation. That might mean that I'm a cell that doesn't have enough energy and I need to find a way to stay alive. This might be a liver cell that is having to supply glucose to the rest of the body. Okay? So all of these things present very, very different situations for um, a cell. And the cell has to be able to respond to all those. And the way cells respond is by making things. And they make things with enzymes. So being able to control enzymes is really very, very critical. All right, so we started talking last time um, about ATCAs. And ATCAs is one of the best examples uh, that we have for an enzyme that is controlled. Okay? So um, ATCase, as I uh, showed last time, catalyzes this reaction up here. Uh, you don't even need to know the intermediates. That's not the most important thing. But that catalyzes the reaction between these two guys. This is aspartic acid, which of course is one of the amino acids um, here in blue. And it makes this 
rather mouthful intermediate that's right here. Now, we're not interested so much in what the reaction is, uh, at least at this point, um, as we are in how this enzyme is controlled. So the enzyme catalyzes the reaction here. You remember that there, after this intermediate is formed, there are a series of about 10 different reactions that occur that are shown by these various arrows here, ultimately resulting in the synthesis of CTP. So this is how we make our pyrimidine nucleotides, CTP, UTP, and ultimately TTP. Okay? So this is how we make them. And as I said last time, the pyrimidine nucleotides in a nucleic acid are paired with purine nucleotides. So the C's and U's, for example, are paired with, uh, with uh, G's and, and uh, A's. Okay? So um, one of the most important things a cell has to maintain is balance. They have to maintain the balance of the nucleotides. And they use it, one of the ways, is by regulating the action, the activity, of ATCase. Okay? So, um, as I noted last time, as CTP concentrations increase, uh, CTP can bind to ATCase and turn the enzyme off, or basically turn the volume down, as I said last time. Okay? That has the effect of stopping the production of this guy right here, which means if this guy isn't available, then all the other things that are made from it, of course, won't be available either. So this is a very efficient way of controlling an entire process, an entire pathway that's used to make CTP. Okay? Stop one enzyme instead of having to stop 10 enzymes. Okay? So this mechanism that you see here, we'll see other examples of it in metabolism over the rest of this term and also next term. This mechanism of regulation is called feedback inhibition. And it's feedback from the end product back to the first enzyme. It's feeding back and it's turning it off. Okay? Well, as I also noted, this enzyme is regulated by three different things. The first one of which I talked about was CTP. The second of which is a purine nucleotide. And a purine nucleotide um, is an important regulator because purines are the complement to the pyrimidines in a nucleic acid. If we have too much in the way of one or the other, then we have a problem. And so cells need to balance how much they have. So if they have too much of one, they want to make more of the other. Well, the purine nucleotide that binds to ATCase is ATP. ATP, of course, we refer to as the gasoline of the cells. When ATP concentrations are high, there's really two things that's going on inside of a cell. One, the cell wants to balance it by making more pyrimidines. Okay? Because if ATP is too high and we don't have pyrimidines high enough, we're going to have a problem. But the second, this is actually even more important to think about, is ATP, because it is the gasoline of the cells, when its concentrations are high, it means the cell has a lot of energy, and the cell is ready to, shall we say, make whoopee. How does a cell make whoopee? By dividing. Okay? Well, for a cell to divide, what does it have to do? It has to have plenty of Nucleotides. So high ATP concentrations are a sign that this cell is ready to party. Okay? And this being ready to party turns on the synthesis of the pyrimidine nucleotides, so the cell has plenty of everything it needs to go through the process of DNA replication and division. So ATP turns out to be a really, really good indicator of the state of a cell. We'll see ATP affects many things. And this is the first enzyme that we see uh, that it has an effect on here. The last thing that binds to ATCase and affects it is actually one of the substrates. Okay? One of the substrates. A substrate for the reaction is this guy right here, aspartic acid. Aspartic acid binds to ATCase and causes the enzyme to become active as well. Okay? Now this also at some level gives some indication about the cell's readiness to divide. When the cell has plenty of amino acids, all right, that's not different from the cell having plenty of ATP. Because amino acids, of course, are used to make proteins, and proteins are necessary for enzymes, and enzymes are necessary for cell division. Okay? So aspartate turns out to be a really good indicator for uh, the need for the cell to go ahead and make pyrimidine nucleotides, and so aspartate turns on this uh, enzyme. 
We're going to see numerous examples of this the more we talk about metabolism with respect to controls that really have very good meaning to the cell in terms of activating or inactivating enzymes. Okay? Allosteric control, which is what we're talking about here, allosteric control is a very powerful thing for the cell, but it also has its roots in very meaningful things uh, for the cell as well. Okay, so um, this shows CTP inhibition, and there's the rate of formation of that intermediate that you saw before. Okay, and there's the concentration of CTP. As we add more CTP, we see the rate goes down. You'll notice the rate does not go to zero. Remember, I said that we, we talk about the enzyme being turned on and turned off, but in reality, the enzyme is being turned down in the volume. This is as low as the volume goes with that enzyme. Okay. Let's see. That's aspartate. That is supposed to show you sigmoidal kinetics, okay? It's not a very good sigmoidal graph, all right? Um, but if it were drawn perhaps a little bit more um, corresponding to uh, a sigmoidal graph, we would recognize this as looking not unlike the binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. Okay? And binding of oxygen to hemoglobin caused hemoglobin to change from the T state to the R state. Okay? Similarly, binding of these uh, allosteric effectors caused the enzyme to change from either T to R if it's being activated, or from R to T if it's being inactivated. So, for example, CT CTP, Gesundheit, CTP will turn the enzyme into the T state. And it turns out, we'll see later, it actually holds the enzyme in the T state. Whereas aspartate and ATP hold the enzyme in the R state. Okay? Uh, we don't need that. And we don't really need that. Okay. Now, this is what ATCase looks like. ATCase is actually quite a bit more complex than hemoglobin is. In hemoglobin, we saw, for example, there were four subunits, two identical subunits called alpha and two identical subunits called beta. Okay? In the case of ATCase, we actually see 12 subunits. We see six identical units that we call catalytic units. They're shown in yellow on the screen above. And we see six identical units called regulatory subunits that are shown in red. Okay. The regulatory subunits are the places where ATP or CTP is bound. They regulate the enzyme. You say, well, why isn't aspartate bound there? The answer is because aspartate is bound at the active site, and the active site is where the, the catalysis actually occurs. So it's in the catalytic site. By the way, you see three, three here, but you're looking at it top down. There's three identical ones on the bottom of that. So there actually are six catalytic and six regulatory subunits. Now, this enzyme is interesting um, in that it, as I said, it flips from the R to the T state. And when we look at it in the R and the T state, it looks something like this. Okay? Now, we can actually see in this figure visually why it is that the T state is less active and why the R state is more active. If we look at it in the R state, starting over here, it favors substrate binding. And it favors substrate binding because substrate's got all kinds of places it can get into the active sites. Over here, the T site, where I described as being uptight, all right, the uptight site here is much more closed. It's much less accessible to substrate. And therefore, the enzyme itself has it's, it's, it's waiting for substrate a lot. There's no substrate to, that can bind because it has a hard time getting into this very tight configuration that's here. So the binding of these allosteric effectors, ATP and CTP, will affect the R and T states of the overall, overall enzyme. Well, the enzyme was interesting in another respect in that it was originally studied okay, using a very interesting inhibitor. Okay? So when we think about an inhibitor of an enzyme, we talked about one um, a, a, a week or so ago, talking about methotrexate. We said it was a competitive inhibitor of an enzyme that was necessary for making nucleotides. Okay? This inhibitor that I'm going to show you acts um, like a competitive inhibitor. Okay? Um, 
And it looks, it, it's called Pala, P-A-L-A. And it's got a long name here. You don't need to know the long name, but, but Pala is it. Okay? What Pala does is it binds uh, to the active site of the enzyme and it makes a covalent bond with it. So if I told you that, based on what you learned from last exam, what would you say about this inhibitor? Su Whoa, suicide. All right. This is a suicide inhibitor, and suicide inhibitors, of course, act like competitive inhibitors, except for the fact that they bind to the enzyme and they don't come off. So this guy is a suicide inhibitor, all right? But a very interesting thing, all right? The suicide inhibitor locks the enzyme in the R state. Does that seem confusing? Yeah. It locks the enzyme in the R state. What does the R state mean? It means that that's the more reactive state of the enzyme. Now, that on the surface seems confusing. It turns out it's not overly confusing. It's actually blocking access to the active site. Well, why is it in the R, in the R state? All right. Well, let's think about this. We talked about three different molecules that can bind to ATCAs. We talked about ATP, CTP, and aspartate. Where did aspartate bind? At the active site, right? And what, did our, what, did, what does aspartate binding to the active site do? It causes the enzyme to flip into the R, R state, right? This is acting like aspartate. It's binding at the active site. The enzyme is going through the configuration that it would go through if it bound to aspartate. The only problem is that Pala is covalently attached to the enzyme, and the enzyme is stuck in the R state. This experiment actually proves that aspartate is, in fact, causing the enzyme to be in the R state. Okay. Now, there's a problem in your book um, that I used to use to give exam questions to you, uh, and I won't use it for an exam question this time, but I'll actually tell it to you because I think it's a, it's a cool uh, experiment. Okay. People find when they did experiments with Pala that they could knock out the enzyme really great, really well. But they found that when they only used a little bit of Pala, that the enzyme actually worked better. Why? Yes, Emily. That's exactly right. So what Emily just said was that if it binds to, let's say, one of the six subunits, and it causes the enzyme to flip into the R state, the other five subunits are open and available under low concentrations. There won't be enough pala to bind to them. And now the substrate can bind to them, and the enzyme is very happy. Kind of a cool thing. Okay? Everybody understand that? What's that? One more time. Okay, so low concentrations of pala means that not all of the catalytic units of the enzyme can get bound by pala. So let's say only one of the six, on average, get bound. When it binds to the enzyme, one pala is enough to cause the enzyme to be in the R state alone. The other five subunits, which aren't bound to pala, are still active. And in fact, they're more active because they're in the R state. And it will bind a substrate and cause the enzyme to be more active than in the absence of a little bit of pala. Okay. Good. Okay, yes? So his question is, as opposed to something that locked it in the T state, Pala would have to bind to all six sites of the enzyme in order to completely an inactivate it, and the answer is yes. Yes. Okay? So if I said to you, I have just invented a T state inhibitor of the enzyme, okay, that completely wipes out the enzyme, what would it have to do? There's a good thought question. I'll leave, leave you guys to think. Maybe that'd be an extra credit question or something. Okay, what would it have to do? So think about that. That's a good, a good thought question. All right? Okay. Let's uh, turn our attention uh, to uh, a couple more things. So here um, is what CTP does. CTP 
takes the enzyme and converts it into, or I shouldn't say it converts it, it actually locks it in the T state. And you're going to see I'm, I'm avoiding using the language of converting the enzyme because ATCase is a good example of an enzyme that doesn't use this conversion model that we talked about with respect to hemoglobin. Okay? So we can see the enzyme in the T state here, and we see it in the T state here, and it turns out that in the T state here, it is locked in the T state. Up here, it turns out it's not locked in the T state. Well, how did it get in the T state to begin with? Well, the answer is that the enzyme only has two possible states to be in, R and T, right? It's going to be in one versus the other. If there's nothing bound to it at all, it's going to be in the R, it's got to be in the T state, right? Well, it turns out with ATCase, what we see is that the enzyme has the ability to flip, okay, let me back up here, to flip between different states, okay? Right. Here's the mechanism that we saw for hemoglobin. Hemoglobin had four subunits. Binding of one, oxygen by one subunit caused the others to start to change, which caused additional binding, which caused additional binding, which caused additional binding, and we saw the phenomenon known as cooperativity. Okay? ATCase doesn't work that way. It's not a cause and effect. Okay? What you just saw, what I just showed you, is the uh, sequential uh, uh, effect. All right? The sequential effect, binding of one, causes a change that favors the binding of number two, that causes a change that favors the binding of number three, that causes a change that favors the binding of number four. ATCase doesn't have that cause-effect phenomenon. Okay? Well, how does it work? It turns out that ATCase, when I go back to my ATCase with nothing bound to it, right um, here, it's in one of those two states. It turns out that the enzyme can flip between R and T all by itself. It doesn't take something binding to it to cause it to flip. Okay? So the sequential model said there was a cause and effect. Binding caused this, caused this, caused this, etc. Right? Now what you're seeing with ATCase is that this guy can flip back and forth on its own, independent of binding something else. So it's either in the R state or it's in the T state. Make sense? Well, then how do we explain this phenomenon of the enzyme's regulation? Very simply. The allosteric effectors lock the enzyme into whatever state it happens to be. So something that's in the T state can bind to CTP, and CTP will lock it in that state. And as long as it's bound to CTP, it's going to stay in that T state. It's not going to flip anymore. It can't flip into R all by itself because it's locked in this state. Similarly, if I have an enzyme in the R state, it's able to bind ATP. And if it binds to ATP, it gets locked in that state and it can't be flipping either until it lets go of ATP. Make sense? This model I've just, talked, I've, I've just described to you is called the concerted model. So the concerted model says that, actually this, this figure is confusing, so don't, don't bother with this figure, but the concerted model says that the flipping of the enzyme is independent of the binding of the effector. It's independent of that. It flips from R to T all by itself. Okay? But what the allosteric effectors do is they lock it in one or the other. Something that's in the T state can only bind to CTP. If there's no CTP, it's not going to bind, and the enzyme, then the enzyme can flip into the R if it wants to. But once CTP is bound to it, it's going to hold it in that T state until it lets go of the CTP. Okay? Now, this figure is designed to show you a little bit about the flipping that's going on. L here is the ratio of the T state to the R state. We see L gets very large when CTP is present because why? Because the enzyme is being held in the T state and there's very little that can flip back to the R state, that is, ones that are unbound with, with CTP. On the other hand, when ATP is present, that ratio gets much smaller. Hello. Gets much smaller, okay? 
And that's because the enzyme, in fact, in the presence of ATP, gets locked in the R state. And so when something comes, when the enzyme comes and flips back into the R state, then it gets held there by ATP. Okay? So the concerted model is fundamentally different from the sequential model. The sequential model has a cause and effect. This has the effect of locking. The overall normal ratio of these, if there's no other things present, the ratio between R and T is about 200 to 1 in favor of T. Okay? Questions about that? Clear as mud? Okay. All right. Now, um, so that's one mechanism. So allosterism, we're going to see numerous examples of allosterism, both this term and next term. Um, allosterism is a wonderful way of controlling enzymes, but it's not the only way of controlling enzymes. Okay? So we're going to see yet another example of controlling enzymes, and uh, actually two more examples of controlling enzymes uh, here today. Okay? So one of these uh, mechanisms of controlling an enzyme is uh, via this molecule right here. Okay? Cyclic AMP, or it's called CAMP, C-A-M-P. Okay? Cyclic AMP is related to the nucleotide AMP, and it has a cyclic bond right here on the end of it that AMP doesn't have, so that's why it's called cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP, we will see, is actually used by cells um, for a very important, uh, part of a very important process we call signaling. It's part of a very important process called signaling. Cyclic AMP, we will describe as a signaling molecule. Okay? It's a signaling molecule. Okay? It, carries, it carries a signal from one place to another. My, phone, my microphone keeps screwing up here. Okay, so how does it work? All right? Well, there's an enzyme called protein kinase A. Protein kinase A. We're going to say a lot more about protein kinase A in the weeks to come. Because protein kinase A does some very, very important things to enzymes. Okay? Protein kinase A actually catalyzes reactions to put phosphates onto enzymes. I'll repeat that. Protein kinase A catalyzes reactions to put phosphates onto enzymes. Now, you might say, well, why does it do that? And to which I would say, well, what effect do you suppose adding negative charges to an enzyme would have? We might see some shape changes. And when we see shape changes, we see differences in activity. And you'd be exactly right. Some enzymes, when they gain phosphates, get more active. Some enzymes, when they gain phosphates, get less active. Protein kinase A helps to control enzyme activities by covalently modifying them. Co protein kinase A affects enzyme activities by covalently modifying them, and that covalent modification is addition of a phosphate. Okay? Well, putting a phosphate on is a pretty important thing. As I said, some enzymes get turned on, some enzymes get turned off. We don't want to have every enzyme in our cells have phosphate on it because we don't want certain enzymes on all the time. We don't want other enzymes off all the time. So it means that we need to also control the activity of protein kinase A. That's part of the signaling process that we'll talk about very shortly. All right? So protein kinase A has to be able to exist in two forms, an inactive form and an active form. Cells, as I will say later, are control freaks. They need to be able to turn things on and turn things off. Yeah, okay, if you can only turn something on, you're in trouble. Okay? All right. So protein kinase A's activity needs to be controlled, and it's controlled by the scheme that you see on the screen. Protein kinase A has two catalytic subunits, and it has two regulatory subunits. The catalytic subunits are shown in blue. And the regulatory subunits are shown in yellow. So there's one unit there, there's one unit there. Okay? Now, when there's no cyclic AMP present, we have a situation that's shown on the left. The regulatory subunits are bound to 
the catalytic subunits, and more importantly, they are sticking their nose in the middle of the active site of the catalytic subunit. Okay? They're sticking their nose in the catalytic site of the, active, of the catalytic subunit. All right? That has the pure effect of 100% completely turning the enzyme off because it can't bind a substrate. This is a mechanism that's 100% effective. You block the access of the active site to the substrate, you're going to stop the enzyme from functioning, and that's exactly, in fact, what happens right here. When the cell gets a signal from outside, and we'll see how that signal happens. It happens by hormones. When a cell gets a signal from the outside, it starts producing cyclic AMP. This signal comes, and the cyclic AMP binds to the regulatory subunits, causes a shape change in them, which causes them to take their noses out of the active site of the catalytic subunits, freeze the catalytic subunits, which become active. Now these catalytic subunits can go and catalyze reactions to put phosphates onto proteins. Make sense? It's a lot of stuff right there. Yes? It's this catalytic subunit, that's right, that's going to go put phosphates onto other proteins. Now I'd like to, at this point, to give you a really cool example about how this works. Something that I think you can relate to, all right? So, we'll talk about this, what I'm going to try to describe here to you here a little bit later. But you can understand it based on what I've told you so far, all right? This catalytic subunit can go put phosphates onto proteins. So, let's imagine I am out in the woods. And I am um, hunting for berries. And I, uh, in my hunt for berries, um, encounter a grizzly bear. They're so prevalent in Oregon, you know. Um, and this grizzly bear um, takes a look at me the wrong way and decides that I'm dinner. Okay? So it starts chasing me. What happens? Well, I panic. I start making adrenaline. That's what happens when we get scared. Our body makes adrenaline. Adrenaline is a hormone. And that hormone travels through our bloodstream. It gets to our liver cells and tells the liver cells, we're in trouble. You better start making glucose because glucose is what our muscles need to run. That happens in a matter of seconds. Okay? Happens in a matter of seconds. What the hormone does when it hits the liver cells is it causes the liver cell to start making cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP starts binding to the regulatory subunits of protein kinase A. Protein kinase A becomes active. It starts phosphorylating proteins. And some of the proteins it phosphorylates are involved in the synthesis of glucose and the breakdown of glycogen. Okay? The synthesis of glucose and the breakdown of glycogen. Glycogen is a polymer of glucose. So the net effect of this is that the liver cell all of a sudden makes a ton of glucose. And it dumps it into the bloodstream, <clears throat> which goes to the muscle cells and gives people abilities to run, to escape, in some cases to lift up a car. Okay? You hear these amazing stories of people who do things when they get scared, and they're true. They're true because there's this gigantic dump of glucose that's happened as a result of that action. Okay? This is very cool. Yes? Ideally, the camp is going to bind to all four sites. That's correct. So the best effect is the more camp you have, the more things are going to be released. That's right. Okay? Other questions? This is really cool, right? Well, I said that we have to have the ability to control enzymes. We've got a problem here, actually, right? Do we want to be continually breaking down all of our glycogen and converting everything else into glucose? Well, you know the answer to that, because I, I've set it up. The answer is no, of course, we don't want to do that. Okay? We don't want to do that. So the cell has to have some way of turning that signal off. Right? Well, it has a nice way of turning that signal off. Our cells have within them an, es an enzyme called phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterase, P-H-O-S, 
P H O D I E S T E R A S E. Phosphodiesterase. Okay? Phosphodiesterase is present in our cells, and what phosphodiesterase does is it breaks down cyclic AMP. So when we get a signal like this, cyclic AMP goes up, and then over time, phosphodiesterase starts catching up and starts breaking down cyclic AMP, and phosphodiesterase goes back down. We give it time, it goes back down. And when it goes back down, this whole process stops. The breakdown of glycogen stops. The glucose levels in our blood go back to normal and everybody's fine and dandy. Okay, That's cool, right? I'll tell you something that's even cooler. There's a very important compound that inhibits phosphodiesterase. It's known as caffeine. Yeah, now let's think about what caffeine's doing. How do we get that buzz in the morning? You actually know. How many of you put a ton of sugar in your coffee? Even if you don't. If you put a ton of sugar in your coffee, you're getting a ton of sugar from the coffee. You're getting caffeine, which is now keeping phosphodiesterase levels high because it's stopping the breakdown. What happens when phosphodiesterase levels, uh, I'm sorry, phosphodiesterase levels, I shouldn't say high, phosphodiesterase levels are low. We're keeping cyclic AMP levels high. Phosphodiesterase levels are low because the enzyme is inhibiting it, right? Cyclic AMP levels rise as a result of that, and high cyclic AMP levels means more glucose in our bloodstream. We're getting our buzz from caffeine because, partly because we're inhibiting this system. Did I just make or break coffee drinkers now? Okay. All right. So if you're drinking a really sweet bunch of coffee, okay, like a specialty drink where they've got all kinds of the crap they put in it, right? All right. You're doing like double duty on the buzz. And the buzz is very real. Coca-Cola does the same thing. Okay? Yeah. I see a lot of people nodding their heads about that one. Okay. Questions about that? You're in a quiet group today. Okay. Uh, that's what's happening um, with caffeine. That's what's happening with this. Okay? Now, one other thing I should mention before I go further. Um, I talked about... Um, what this enzyme does. What this enzyme does, it puts phosphates onto proteins. But I said if cells have ways of turning things on, they also want to have a way of turning it off, right? But what about all those phosphates that put onto proteins? Those proteins, do we want to keep them in the phosphorylated state forever? Nope. You know the answer to that one, too. Turns out cells have another enzyme called phosphatase. Phosphatase. P-H-O-S-P-H-A-T-A-S-E. Phosphatase takes phosphates off of proteins. So when I say cells are control freaks, they really are. They have the ability to put things on, take things off, turn things on, turn things off. And they're using these controls to respond to what the body needs. Okay? Very, very important things. They're doing these things to respond to what the body needs. Okay. That is what I want to say there. Let's turn our attention to yet another way of controlling enzymes. One other way of controlling enzymes. This is known as covalent modification. Okay. Well, you saw it sort of with the phosphorylation. But this covalent modification I'm going to talk about is actually cleaving peptide bonds. Cleaving peptide bonds. Okay. All right. So... Um, these, well, this, this shows in summary, I guess, all the different covalent modifications that, that, that can happen. Okay? This is not a table I'm asking you to memorize. Don't worry about it. All right? But it just illustrates the various things that can happen to proteins. I've already talked about phosphorylation. Phosphorylation affects glycogen metabolism. Okay? Acetylation is uh, an activity that uh, puts acetyl groups onto proteins. Meristoylation puts a, a, a fatty acid onto proteins. ADP ribosylation puts ADP onto uh, proteins. Uh, Farnesylation, a variety of things that all happen here. This one down here is, is kind of important because the ubiquitination is a way for the cell to flag a protein that needs to be broken down. S proteins that need to be broken down are ubiquitinated. 
And that tells the cell, this protein is no longer needed, break it up. Okay? Okay. So, I'm going to focus specifically on covalent modification. Okay? Well, actually, let me back up on it. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> I forget what I have in my lecture here. All right. So, um, I didn't show you the reactions for phosphorylation. So, phosphorylation reactions that the, that the protein kinase A is catalyzing um, occurs on two different amino acid side chains, okay? Either serine or threonine, all right? So you can see it schematically depicted here. Here's the hydroxyl group of a side chain of either serine or threonine. Here's ATP with, a, with three phosphates on it. Protein kinase A, and there's other protein kinases as well, which is why they didn't put A here, takes that, puts a phosphate onto there, and leaves ADP uh, as a result, okay? A phosphatase will take that phosphate right there and remove it, okay? Now, you notice up here it says, or tyrosine. Well, protein kinase A does not affect tyrosine. Other, pro, uh, other uh, protein kinases affect tyrosine. And tyrosine turns out to be a really interesting and important one for phosphorylation because enzymes and, and proteins in cells that play very important roles in deciding whether to divide or not frequently are affected by phosphorylation on tyrosine. So it takes different kinases to put uh, a phosphate onto a tyrosine. Okay? And we'll talk more about those when we talk about signaling. All right. So that's uh, what's putting them on there. Um, serine threonine um, protein kinases, are, there's a variety of them. Protein kinase A is, is, is one of them. Protein kinase C is another one that we'll talk about. Okay. All right. Dephosphorylation happens as a result of action of a phosphatase. There's the phosphate, there's water, there's our enzyme, and there's the products over here. So the phosphate that we put on can be removed, and that enzyme now is in a different state than it was before. Please note that phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, for some enzymes corresponds to activation, inactivation. For other enzymes, it refers to inactivation, activation. So there's no one set rule. We'll see some common patterns, though, when we talk about regulation later. Okay. Wow, yeah. <laughs> the sighs are, are, are rising here, right? Okay. Well, I want to say just a little bit about, I'm going to introduce the topic of zymogens uh, here, um, and then uh, we'll finish up with something else, okay? Zymogens are enzymes that are released by cells in an inactive form. Enzymes that are released by cells in an inactive form. Well, why would cells release enzymes? And more importantly, why would they release them in an inactive form? Okay. Well, there are a variety of reasons why cells will release enzymes. Right? But one of the most important ones is going on in digestion. Digestion is occurring not inside of cells, but outside of cells. Okay? Digestion, the process of digestion is going on outside of cells. And enzymes catalyze that digestion. And proteases are important enzymes in that digestive process. So proteolytic enzymes, you just dropped your billfold right there. Uh, proteolytic enzymes, okay, are needed for the digestive process. Well, one of our main sources of proteolytic enzymes for digestion is our pancreas. Pancreas makes digestive enzymes. Well, digestive enzymes, uh, particularly proteases, are a problem for a cell. Why? Well, if we look at the membrane of a cell, for example, membranes of cells are loaded with protein. And what do proteases do? They break down protein. So if an enzyme, like in the pancreas, that is making proteolytic enzymes, releases them in an active state, those enzymes are going to attack the very cell that makes them, and we're going to have problems. Right? So instead of making them, releasing them in an active state, they're released in an inactive state, and they get activated later. That protects the pancreas. Okay. There's a problem, though. The problem is that what does it take to activate a protease? Well, it takes another protease. And what does it take to activate that protease? It takes another protease. There's a cascade of proteases that have to act to get the enzymes active. 
Now, it turns out that's not really a problem because they're very well set up to break down proteins. And if breaking down proteins is activating proteins, you can imagine that happens pretty quickly, pretty readily. It does. It can happen a little too readily. We would like for that process to occur in our digestive system where the enzymes become active at the place where we need them to become active. But if they become a little bit overly active, they start backing up and getting closer and closer to the cells that made them. If they back up far enough and they actually start attacking the cells that made them, we get a very painful disease called pancreatitis. Pancreatitis occurs when proteolytic enzymes start attacking the pancreas. If it's left untreated, it can be fatal. Okay? Now, many people have it. It's not always fatal, obviously. But, if you get, but, but it's a very painful uh, disease. Okay? It takes fairly rigorous treatment um, to uh, stop from happening. How many people know somebody who's had pancreatitis? A few, usually. Okay. Were they in pain? A lot of pain? Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay, so not something you want to mess with. Well, I talked about how uh, this cascade of activations actually has to happen. And this is a little bit about what it looks like. All right? So here's our friend chymotrypsin over here. Chymotrypsin, it turns out, is made in an inactive form known as chymotrypsinogen, which gets converted by the enzyme trypsin. Trypsin, in fact, itself is made in an inactive form, and it's converted by the enzyme enteropeptidase. You start saying, well, where's the very first one? Well, there's not really a very first one, because all these are sort of floating around in our digestive system. Okay? All right. But we can imagine if we start backing up the chain, and we start backing up the chain, we can start backing up in the direction of the pancreas, and that's exactly what happens. Not only do we see en the proteolytic enzymes being uh, uh, regulated in this way, we also see over here prolipase going to lipase. Lipase is an enzyme that breaks down fat. Okay. I'm going to say more about that next time, but I thought we would finish today with a song to sum everything up. Dad's here. It's a good time to do two songs, so let's do two songs. This one is called, it's all about proteins. It's called The Way They Work. If I can get it to work. There we go. Yep. Sing along. I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> slow. It's a hard one to sing.
All right.